Welcome to the Native Americans and Philanthropy Podcast, where we have honest, straightforward, and to-the-point conversations about promoting effective and sustainable philanthropy in tribal communities. In this episode, Kelly Begay, Chief Strategy and Operations Officer of Native Americans in Philanthropy, sits down with Valerie Segrest, Native American Agricultural Fund's Regional Director of Native Food and Knowledge Systems, to talk about Native nutrition and food systems. This episode is the newest installment of our COVID-19 Community Conversation Series and was recorded in March to observe National Nutrition Month. My name is Kelly Begay. I'm with Native Americans in Philanthropy, and this is part of our our newer series of a community conversation. And since it is March and it's Nutrition Month, um, and my background is in nutrition as a registered dietitian, I thought it'd be nice to have a conversation with um, one of my colleagues, Valerie Segrist, who's done a lot of work in the world of Native nutrition and food systems, food sovereignty. Valerie was actually a contributor to our report that we released last December um, related to indigenous community leadership in response to COVID-19. And it was a call to action for the philanthropic sector. So we highlighted different community perspectives and Valerie helped us out there um, around food systems. So just glad to be here and welcome you, Valerie. Thanks for having me, Kelly, and um, so good to see you, even if we're in Zoom land. That's wonderful. (laughs) Um, My name is Valerie Segrist. I'm a member of the Muckleshoot Tribe, located just south of Seattle, Washington, and my background is in nutrition, um, which is how Kelly and I uh, know each other and live in this space together, Um, and I also studied food systems work. I, for the last, uh, oh man, over a decade now, I've worked uh, with within the food sovereignty movement and have uh, been managing a project in my own community called the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project, um, where we've just really built up a sort of suite, a catalog of nutrition um, education around culturally relevant diets and traditional foods. Um, we worked in the realm of policy. We've uh, done food resource uh, inventories of where we could be growing food or cultivating food um, in our traditional and accustomed territories. And now I work for the Native American Agriculture Fund, which is a native led nonprofit charitable trust fund. So we are, uh, we give money, we award money to um, initiatives that support Native American farmers, ranchers, fishers, harvesters, agriculturalists uh, throughout North America. And I'm really excited to be working for this organization because it's, I've spent my, my last, um, the beginning of my career really focused on the Northwest and you know, some spaces beyond. Uh, I have a love affair with the Southwest, so there, there you go. Um, but this has really opened my eyes to all of the amazing work that's happening across Indian country um, around the food movement and really upholding and uplifting our uh, native food production and revitalizing and, uh, you know, really making sure those uh, food systems are connected and well um, moving, have all their moving parts operating well. And so there's a zillion amazing impacts happening every single day in our in our communities. Um, and I'm just like really grateful to be able to to brag about it and uh, and share their stories and just be a witness to the amazing work that's happening. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, just being in this field of being able to reach more people and feeling like you have more of an impact, right, with more communities, more of our Native people, and learning about all the things that are happening all over, um, which is hard to keep a pulse on because a lot of times we're invisible, you know, in general. And then as it relates to the really great things that are happening in our communities around nutrition, especially, um, you know, it sometimes doesn't always 
is not seen, right? Like it's not, it doesn't always come to light. And so um, I'm really glad that you're working um, with the Native American Agriculture Fund and um, just to have that partner in nutrition and native nutrition is really cool. So um, it being at March and native, or that's no, actually not native nutrition month. I mean, it is for us, but it's <laughs> nutrition month in general. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's, it's awesome to have this conversation with you. So we're actually going to shift a little bit and talk about some of the resilience and the stamina that our communities had and or have and especially how they responded to the pandemic. Um, so how did you see in your own work, how did you see tribal communities respond? Um, I, I am, <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> I am so amazed, kind of, but not really. I mean, we come from resilient people we have work to do, you know, and, and our communities, um, we have the incredible ability to make grassroots efforts, um, realized, you know, I see that time and time again in our communities and, and our, um, grantees are not like risks at all. You know, they're incredible investments uh, that are made into these native led organizations and tribal governments that, um, that really stand up and create solutions in especially times like last year. It started out a little panicky. You know, you could kind of hear the shrill in people's voices and our grantees voices, <laughs> but by the like week two, three, after the shelter in place orders were coming down across the country, people had solutions that were brilliant. They weren't just short term solutions either. They mm -hmm. are sustainable and long lasting. We saw um, NAF uh, had a rapid response fund that we, we put out for our 2019 grantees. And uh, they all took that funding, every single one of them, and just scaffolded on their ongoing efforts in ways that are going to um, create really long-term impacts in their communities. We saw um, meat processing facilities be stood up in seven months. We saw wow. um, oh Navajo farmers in Utah who, who needed water for decades um, finally get water tanks <laughs> delivered. We saw people who you know, who were dry, who are in these incredibly food insecure communities. Some of them drive three hours to the grocery mm -hmm. store to find bare shelves. Our native yeah. nonprofit organizations were generating grocery lists, um, finding donors, going to the grocery stores, resourcing those um, items that were needed in communities and then delivering them out there in like blink of an eye, like yeah. access that our government couldn't figure out that um, non Native led uh, nonprofit organizations couldn't figure out our grassroots efforts on the grounds had done in minutes. It was amazing. Even just the transition to like virtual reality, that was wild too to see how, how really, and there's a lot of conversation about this right now with education, how some people were actually really thriving in that environment. It kind of pushed us into um, a space I think people have been really hesitant to get into for a while. And that's okay, you know, to, to have that kind of hesitancy. But what we're seeing are these incredible outcomes. And, um, and they're unmatched, to be honest. It's really wild. It illuminated all these cracks, you know. There's a lot of organizations, I think, uh, Native Americans in Philanthropy is one of them. NAS really trying her, our best, illuminative, you know, all, just capturing the impacts as they're going, just to be able to tell the story of when this happened, we, we learned from our history how to respond. And so tribes being, you know, Muckleshoot was one of the first to shut down up here um, in Washington State where the sort of center of outbreaks happened for the country. Um, and that was a major decision <laughs> to be made. We're one of the largest employers in South King County. So we see our impacts and our strengths. And it's sort of like a, this beautiful time to, to say, 
lean into tribes. You know, we've got solutions to <laughs> these issues. We've got people in place who understand how to activate a phone tree and respond in times of crisis. And that's our strength. Um, so yeah, like come to us for good, true partnership. Cause we have some solutions. Yeah. And I think we've proven time and time again, that we can do a lot with very, very little, <laughs> I mean, like with nothing, you know, it's like whenever we're okay, whenever we have enough of what we need, and we have extra, we help, we share, we give it to those who don't, right? And I think that's just a natural way of being for us as Native people that I don't think is, is um, mainstream. Being a good relative, right? Like just being a good person, being a good neighbor, it, you know, there's a lot, like for us, I think it's something that we don't think about, but it's like, when other people see it, they don't, you know, the outside world is like, Oh, why would you do that? You know, it's like, this is what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you know, it's not yeah. just fit no, for yourself. Those are those cultural tenets that hold us up that I think are, you know, what, do, what is the response to resiliency, the, the being a historian, like knowing, you know, we knew uh, very well what, the effects of tuberculosis and smallpox and, you know, the Spanish mm -hmm. flu, like all of those things that really hit us hard um, in our communities, we knew how, how important it was to prioritize this outside of all the other, you know, gibber, whatever that was going on, <laughs> all the yeah. gossip and unknowns and conspiracy theories that were just flying around. We still took it serious. Mm -hmm. And, that being a historian, um, to your point, Kelly, like being generous and um, being a good ancestor, like those are all the sort of filters in our culture that help us respond in times like this and just like live a, live a, a peaceful life. So now that we're kind of on this um, cusp of recovering, you know, with vaccinations, with hopefully COVID being in our rearview mirror. <laughs> so how do you see tribal communities recovering in the area of native nutrition and strengthening or restoring food systems? Well, because we, we sort of had all these moving parts flying around our food systems minds over here at NAF, um, we sat down and, and wrote uh, the vision statement, which is on our website, nativeamericanagriculturefund.org. And it is a, a sort of meant to be the start of a discussion around how we solve the issues of food infrastructure in this country. And that Native America has all the answers, of course, because we have land and people whose, you know, in our cultural legacies are about cultivating food and health and a good environment for people to be able to thrive in. And so um, the, the infrastructure vision statement, um, check it out. It's just, you know, the beginning of a discussion about what we would need to be able to make this happen to not just only feed our communities, but also, you know, the broader society <laughs> we can make impacts there. I mean, to the nutrition geeky part of us, right? It's like mm -hmm. everything we need in this country, we have got malnourishment spanned over a lifetime produces the epidemics that we're seeing in our community, uh, like diabetes, heart disease, mm -hmm. certain cancers. They're all relevant to being malnourished in certain nutrients. Um, and most even just standard Americans have a hard time meeting those uh, dietary guidelines our ancestors had even higher amounts in their dietary guidelines. And the answer, if you were to go um, to the USDA database, nutrient database right now and type in foods highest in calcium or zinc, things that we would need to be able to build our immune system up to not have such poor effects of pan in pandemics and epidemics. <laughs> They're yeah. always a native food. It's always pumpkins or squash or oysters 
you know, or salmon, like it's, it's always a food that's indigenous to this continent. That is the remedy that we need in our communities and beyond. And that when we can, you know, stand up our native American farmers and, um, and agriculturalists to be able to produce these things, we ourselves will fit, will be better nourished in this country. And that will decrease our, our incidences of those um, d- nutrition related diseases that are the top three causes of mortality, not just in our communities, but globally. So we really mm-hmm. do have that like sweet spot to be able to lean into. And I guess, you know, Kelly, that's probably why we're in this, this sort of odd, like one <laughs> world of nutrition, because we couldn't be the kind of nutritionist that or dietitians that sat behind a desk and prescribed a diet to people that we knew yeah. We didn't have access to or that that system didn't exist the remedy really has to be in in getting these food systems dialed in so that people can be well nourished um less hunger less food insecurity mm-hmm. but that you know that advocacy part is just as applicable in our practice as anything else we have to right. be right mm-hmm. we have to be figuring out these problems or it does yeah. not matter what we give our people <laughs> to what we tell them to eat because they don't have access to it. Right. Yeah. I mean, and thank you for bringing that up because, you know, nutrition is so broad anyway. I mean, just, but then when you look at specific communities like ours, we have different and unique needs and challenges that aren't, you know, again, a mainstream. We have our strengths, of course, but, you know, we there are things like food insecurity, access to healthy foods. You know, we want our families and relatives to not be hungry for one, but then, you know, to have access to nutritious foods and going back to our traditional ways and but more so just access right to to food yeah. um, and real food. <laughs> so I wanted to I saw that NAF had has released a survey. Can you talk a little bit more about that? This is really exciting for me because I'm a nutrition geek and <laughs> data geek. Jeannie hit my boss and I um, were sort of kind of struck by the lack of actual surveying of food insecurity and hunger rates in tribal communities pre-COVID. Then right happen and we knew that these impacts were happening but there's actually no clear there's no one survey that actually tries to measure this in tribal communities the Mm -hmm. closest we get is the um, census pulse household pulse data and we are not even written into the algorithms there (laughs) it is if you check native american box you're automatically put into the subsection of checking a box saying that you're of more than one race. And so there is no actual data on just Indian country. <laughs> and, uh, and that seems crazy to me because mm-hmm. we are subscribers of these federal feeding programs, which are informed by this data. When I asked to look at it, I was told that I'd have to pay like a lot of money to go fly somewhere and sit and look at their computer screen to see if there was even any data. And then in November, that whole election thing came out and the something else box came out. And Jeannie and I were just like, we have to do, this has to happen. (laughs) And that's why it's so important to us because we, we at this current point in time have no clear picture as to what food insecurity is in tribal communities mm-hmm. at large. So whether you're on a reservation or you live in the city of Seattle, we don't know what your what right. your insecurity rate is. And this survey has been designed on the back end to be bulletproof, to be able to stand up and compare to data sets that um, federal feeding programs have to this, what the census data has, which was really, we had really poor outcomes last year because of mm-hmm. And I recognize as an as a indigenous researcher that putting a hyperlink survey out there is not the best way to collect data in our community, but it's all we have right now because I don't want to put people in harm's way, but I really need everyone possible out there to respond to this. It takes, I took the cognitive burden off, so it's 
less than um, the average time is like eight minutes to get through it. But um, it measures, you know, what insecurity rates look, food insecurity rates look like pre COVID during and where you're at presently. And, um, and then that will be something that we will be able to utilize to in better inform our federal feeding programs about our needs, but also to be able to say, hey, farmers, like we need you because look at all of this <laughs> information we're getting. And preliminary data is showing us that we have, we have an increase in, subscri in subscriptions to SNAP. Um, we have like a 600% increase in people ordering their groceries online or doing pickup groceries which I think is really interesting information to know. If you're out there trying to solve these problems in your community and you are thinking about standing up a grocery store or something like that, to know that our people are you know, able to navigate a system and put a grocery list together and drive up and pick up items, that may be you know, a good solution for you to have in your community. And this hunger survey is telling us that. So I want, I need more respondents. I really need, you know, response rates, like really good response rates so that we can be better informed. And, um, and we, you can take the survey by going to the Native American Agriculture Fund.org website, and it will be open till April 30th. So the entire month of April, we're extending the deadline. Awesome. And, you know, related to that, so we're talking about you know, the data is not there. Um, you know, we're really trying to work hard to get more information. We know that data is important, especially for funders. What do you want the philanthropic sector to know or support as it relates to Native nutrition issues? Like, how can they help? Our communities, tribal communities, and Native-led nonprofits that are working in this space are the best investments you can make. And we need investment. We need help um, getting these things done because every single day we're making magic happen. I, I mean, even just in our, let's see, we have put out in three grant cycles at, the, at NAF, we've done 28 million in grants and um, some just really amazing outcomes. In just one short grant funding cycle, we have had Flower Hill Institute, for example, that was able to deliver thousands of pounds of seeds to over 1,700 Native Americans from over 100 communities, tribal oh, communities. Wow. We've had people producing Facebook Live and Vimeos on how to preserve foods during the middle of the pandemic and reached over 60,000 people viewing just one tutorial. And that's just one tutorial. They're combined. It's in the millions. Um, $675,000 of our funds went directly to students for scholarships mm -hmm. because we know that uh, training and career tech and educational programs that are focused on food systems work is you know, what people are really asking for. And our CDFI programs, our community development financial institutions <laughs> are getting uh, funds, our funds directly to farmers faster than we can get it out the door. I mean, they are, they're really like, we have the sweet spot of investment right here in Indian country. We've always been just so, um, what do I want to say? Just able to respond and, when they, when our grantees say they're going to do something, they always go above and beyond. Always, yeah. it's just in our nature to mm -hmm. be our best and and really show that we're great investments to make. And so, um, you know, if you're in a philanthropic organization trying to figure out how to help an Indian country, call us. Mm -hmm. um, out. I have over 170 grantees that will gladly take your investment and make magic happen with it and really solve, like make long-term problems uh, go away <laughs> in a matter of months. It's incredible what people can do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's awesome. I um, totally agree. We know how best to invest, um, you I know, like funds. <laughs> in our communities. And um, we all, like you said, we always go above and beyond 
of what's expected. But we also at the same time need that flexibility where it's not tied to like one single little thing we need, it needs really needs to be general operating, right? Like we need to be able to have unrestricted, true investment, almost like capital, right? To be able to do these programs, help our farmers, you know, so that's, I think a caveat to all of that, you know, just saying, don't tell us what to do with the investment that you give. Um, like we know what to do. We know really yeah, you don't need to be building up new business plans from, from scratch. We've had them ready to go for a long time. Yeah, you're right. We we definitely just need we just need freedom to be able to to make it to make it happen and not be so restricted because it's like what somebody asked me once like why do you do this work and I'm I guess my response is like why wouldn't I? <laughs> what what else would I do with my life? This is like what my ancestors did. This is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm here to do. And when you have that, to me, is just like a really different kind of investment to make. Right. Yeah. 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 Like I think we have that sense of responsibility for all of everyone, <laughs> not just us, not just our family. I mean, it's for our whole communities our tribes are, you know, just native people in general, like we hold that responsibility. Well, at least I feel like I do anyway, you know, like I need to be able to help and do as much as I can do in however way I, you know, can fulfill that. So, yep. okay. Well, it's been really a great conversation and seeing you through a screen. I know it's not, you know, our favorite, but again, we're going to try to um, make this interesting for other people to listen to. It was definitely interesting for me. <laughs> so, so before we close, I just wanted to ask you one closing uh, question about what your, what native nutrition book or resource do you recommend to our viewers and why? And actually before you go there, I do have to say that Valerie has written a book herself. And so check that one out. Of course, I don't, I usually have, I just moved, but I would normally have it like <laughs> in an arm's reach. Right. Um, but yes, sorry. Yeah, Tell there me. are so many amazing curriculum just popping up everywhere. You know, it's, it's really cool. Um, I'm interested in what the indigenous food lab is working on and, and pushing out. I've um, Dana, Thompson and Sean Sherman are really close colleagues of mine. And I've gotten the ability to, to see sort of what they're wanting to get out the door um, through Indigenous Food Lab, which is a nonprofit that he's been, they've both been just dedicating their whole life to, to standing up. Um, so coming soon, lots of really fun stuff. Um, in his book, The Sioux Chef, Indigenous, uh, The Indigenous Kitchen, that's a uh, full of fun recipes I've put out and they're all available online through the Northwest Portland area Indian health board. There's the native infusion rethink your drink curriculum. That. That, that's all focused on how you can start with just encouraging more ancestral beverages in your life and less sugary beverages. Um, and that comes with a poster series. The poster series is sort of like counter marketing. Like instead of saying, you know, Gatorade quenches your thirst. We're saying uh, evergreen tree tips help you be resilient. <laughs> so, uh, or nettles building stamina or huckleberry leaf uh, food is medicine, you know, the, the sort of messaging that goes with it. So that's really fun. We've also got uh, a, just a simple recipe book called Feeding Seven Generations. That's available at chatwinbooks.com. And our posters are uh, available there too. If you're in a tribal community and you want to um, buy some, we have uh, different rates for tribal communities. So it's uh, like basically at cost, what it cost mm -hmm. us to be able to do that. Um, and then the Urban Indian Health Institute also has a great resource. Um, mm -hmm. And every year for the last several years and for the next couple of years, um, I'm working on content for them as well. And got a whole bunch of stuff on that website as well. And it's all free content. You can just look up. Awesome. But really appreciate your time and energy and all the work that you're doing. Um, it's, 
You're yeah, you're one of my heroes for sure. So oh, I, I really appreciate you everything you're for, doing. No, thank you all for being in this space and just do you know doing this work. It's it feeds us um, in in ways that we're not taught right in nutrition school about that kind of <laughs> that kind of feeding and nourishing and and even just being in partnership with you, Kelly, is nourishing. So I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. All right. So as we close, Valerie, I just wanted to ask if there's um, anything you want to plug or, you know, just telling us where we can find um, your organization or any social handles. Yeah. Um, check us out at Native American Agriculture Fund.org. Oh, my gosh. That's like the longest domain name. And, um, and NAF is also on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. All right. And you can find Native Americans in Philanthropy at Native Giving on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So thanks for joining us, everybody. And we will chat soon.